Shut up, compressor. Yeah, low shoot from close. Hey everyone, Matt here with Duke's Models, and welcome to episode 2 of the Meng F4G Wild Weasel build. Now, in episode 1, we got the cockpit built and installed into the one-piece fuselage. Also, kind of off-screen, I drilled these holes that are called out in the instructions, and now we're ready to move on to the next steps. The first thing that Meng has you do after installing the cockpit is installing this weird-ass box for some ass reason. I don't know. One of the things that manufacturers do just to do. But I already checked this out. I already played around with a couple different things in terms of fitting because I have no intention of just leaving a random gaping hole on the side of the aircraft. But Ming has engineered this in a pretty clever way. So you can see sort of the indent here. It's got like a little frame out. This just goes right in here like this. If you know, there's something I want to do first. If you look at it, there's some slight, very, very slight roughness of texture on the uh, outward facing shit. Technical term. So, infinity file to the rescue. And then that thing just fits in there so nicely. Just like that. It's even got a little ridge right there to hold it to the cockpit so it doesn't go too deep. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here, give that a little tap, just to glue it in place, and then we're going to place this B-19 piece, which is the, the outer skin. It just sits on there like that. It's nice and easy. So now that that's on there, Play a little bit of extra thin into the panel line right there. I'm just gonna tap, 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 tap. Don't want it spooging half welded plastic out of the seam, but I do want it to be of a piece. Okay. Next up, it is time to move on to, well, shit, I'm not dealing with the uh, the heat shielding and this, that's too much to deal with right now. So next up, we'll be moving on to the auxiliary air intake internals with, you know, a little glimpse of the engine right there, which it doesn't matter. You're not going to see it. I feel like this is a bit of overkill, but whatever. And then we're going to do the main gear base and the nose gear bay. So buckle up. We're about to paint a lot of shit white. All right, let's build some gear bays. So this is the nose gear bay. Parts fit together. Nice. There's no, uh, no squirreliness about angles or anything like that. They just snap into place. Now, one thing worth noting here is that there's really not a lot of sidewall detail on this nose gear bay. And I honestly don't know whether to celebrate this or to bitch about it. On the one hand, uh, they should put more detail in here. This is kind of a weak effort. On the other hand, I go on and on and on about how the bottom of an aircraft shouldn't matter. Uh, particularly one that is as sort of like bottom down as the F4, where it's got the low wing and, never, you know, you're not going to be looking up under it. You just can't. There's really not a good way to do that. And that's particularly true when you have something like a wild weasel, because you've got the you know, you've got the uh, ALQ pod hanging off where the sparrow should be, and that's obstructing part of it. Then you've got the, you know, you've got the gear bay. And yeah, it's just silly to kind of get your shit in a twist about gear bay details. And if you really want to add them, I'm sure you could. 
and I'm sure somebody will be happy to sell you something uh, that will have more detail in it. For me, this is plenty. I'm probably going to paint this before I install it, but let's just see what it looks like once it goes into the uh, into the big fun time, shall we? Yeah, it basically just sits in there like that. Turn it over, and there's your gear bay. Neat. All right, let's get to the main gear bay. Thankfully, uh, Meng does not make you install the gear strut beforehand, academy style, so they've got that going for them. We've got this sort of insert piece. And the end piece that goes on. It's always fascinating to see how different kits approach the same exact fucking thing, right? This seems just straightforward. Very uh, reminiscent of the Tamiya kit, actually. And then this whole thing, basically, you just come over here, and just kind of toss it in the direction of the gear bay. And there we go. Add a little bit of glue around the outside. And yeah, that's that's pretty much that right there. All right, next we're moving on to the air intakes, and they're fine. They're very similar to the Zukimura, the sort of top bottom clamshell approach, and they've got some ejector pins. As I discussed on the Zukimura build, they don't matter that much on an F4. You really don't see that deep into the intakes except from very certain angles, and we're not too worried about those. But, just for good hygiene, let's go ahead and... Okay, let's try that again with some UV curing glue. Now the funny part is, I can't figure out where I put my... There it is. Alright, time for some UV light. And now it's time to get some color down on the intakes. And since these are a Desert Storm era F4G, we're talking neutral gray and gunship gray. And of course, the way the hill scheme works, the leading edges or the leading portion of the intakes was in neutral gray. So FS36270, here we go. I'm not being too precious about a lot of this. A lot of the outer intake will, of course, get repainted with priming and the main paint job and all that. So we're hitting the point now where it's time to start getting some stuff attached into the lower fuselage wing piece. And I'm going to start with the intakes. And these, you know, they've been painted good enough. Phantom intakes, you can't see all that far down them anyway. You've got a whole bunch of stuff in front. Like this is the, the piece that will be sitting in front. Even like that, you can't see much. You know, you block the back of it off with something. You can't see hardly anything at all. And then you've got all the fuselage shit to worry about. Yeah, it's it's fun. So these actually fit in quite well, but I'm gonna get a little bit of a head start here by placing some to me extra thin in those mounting holes. And the way this thing goes in literally sits in those. And it sits back here. That's all there is to it. Nothing nothing fancy. We just get some glue on that. And yeah, look at the back. It looks really nasty back there. Um, but we don't see that part. So these are one of those where I am not at all adhering to the but I know it's there principle. It's the I don't care principle. Okay, next up we've got the wing tips. And I absolutely love these things. I know I did a whole weasel off on just the wing tips between these and the Zuki Mirror kit, but fuck. That, that's perfect. <laughs> just be able to just place these there. Don't have to worry about them wiggling up and down in any 
kind of bullshit direction or any of that. It's like, nope, they just sit just like that. It's awesome. I'm very glad that uh, somebody finally, outside of Tamiya, finally thought about how to do that right. So, basically, we start with that. We come in, we place the upper wing where it needs to go. Oh, I gotta get rid of these pieces of tape. They're fucking with me. So, we're gonna place a little bit of glue in there, up here, and down here. Basically, just kind of get that other one in a minute. <laughs> All right. Make sure we got sort of good placement here, like on the back side. I've got my quick setting. Yeah, that's basically all there is to it. Just Ming makes this easy. Good on them. All right, so to paint these compressor faces, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction. I'm going to use some MRP titanium, which is a nice sort of warm, silvery color. And I'm going to mix in some MRP dark gold gray. But seriously? Instead of putting the shit back in the jar, I just shot myself in the hand with the pipette. That's fucking wonderful. All right, so the spill has been contained, and now it is time to go ahead and get this shit down onto the compressor face. I find it very hard to get too excited about these things because they are so far down the intakes that all you see is the barest hint of something. And with the remaining paint in the cup, I'm just going to go ahead and get a little bit of color down here on the rear engine face and the afterburner ring. These aren't going to stay this way. They're going to get a little bit more colorful, but honestly, I don't want to get let this uh, paint in the cup go to waste. Yay, exciting. Okay, next up for the afterburner rings, I want to try to get kind of close to the reference photo I've got showing the ring literally looking green. So I'm using some MRP bronze green. It's a very blue-green color. And some anodized aluminum, which is a very warm, almost goldish aluminum type color. And it helps kind of tone down the blue in the green when you put the yellow in there. But hope is to get a decently fun color on this thing. We still have a little bit of that metallic-iness going on. And then coming in and cutting that with, uh, you know, various weathering excitement to bring it to life. But yeah, that's a fucking crazy ass color cool okay now for the main exhaust trunk i've gone ahead and painted i painted this some green i think this might just be straight up mrp interior green over no primer whatever uh it needs to be a little bit more of a vibrant green than that and just because we're talking buried ass exhaust here i'm going with a mix of soviet protective green and the super vibrant super saturated green for wheels So how does this shake out on this green base? About like that. Now I would care about getting a lot of variation here and stuff, but I mean, we're talking some, you know, this is an exhaust thing on an engine that you're not going to see shit. So 
We just need the base color. Yay, so there you go. That is uh, without anything, and you already can't see shit. You know. Okay, next up, for dealing with the rear engine face, I want to go a bit darker, and I want to go a bit browner. So, using a little bit of black, a little bit of burnt iron, and a little bit of chestnut brown to create this lovely, grungy brown, steel-type shade. You gotta remember, this is gonna be looked at down the length of a barrel with that afterburner thing on top of it. So if it looks a bit heavy-handed right now, just remember its final form is gonna be something more like that, right? So, yeah. All right, next we're doing a very lazy wash with some Mr. Weathering Color Multi-Black. Basically getting in here and making sure that we're going to pick out all of the fin detail, etc. The whole idea here is just to build contrast. So if anybody does actually look down the intakes, they can see some hint of detail going on. That's all that we're doing here. Basically like that. I'll let those fuckers dry. Okay, so for the afterburner ring, we're not going to do the black wash. We're going to do a different wash with this Mr. Weathering Color white dust. Now, the name of this game is basically building contrast that we can use later. So, I know I literally just said that I was going to do a little tiny bit of weathering up in here in the exhaust beyond what I've already done with the Mr. Weathering Colors, but nah. Mainly because this view right here is better than you will ever see in the Wild Weasel when it's buttoned up and sitting properly. You know, I mean, it will be more shaded, um, you know, like... I can't even block it off properly to show it to the camera, but yeah, this view is ideal, and even that, you can't really see shit. And that's when this thing is just naked with no aircraft around it, with no exhaust on top of it. When you put the exhaust on it, you know, your your view closes down substantially. So, fuck it, we're just going to glue it. There's literally no reason to spend more time on it than that. So, we've got our Tamiya Extra Thin Quick setting. We've got this thing kind of held shut. I'm going to hit it first on these big tabs. And then we're going to run it down the side. We can probably pull out the, that for the moment. And then for the rear face, same thing. Kind of letting the solvent and capillary goodness do its thing here. Wahoo. There's your engine. And next up, time to glue these bastards into place. So I'm going to start by putting some extra thin into these mounting holes. Getting those all centered, orchestrated, etc. And getting the engines glued in place. I do like the way that Ming has engineered the engine system here without any of the faffing about with the full engine hiding in the fuselage where it'll never be seen. I like that they've engineered this support system into the lower fuselage. So, you know, if somebody, say, res kit, wanted to come in here and make some glorious engines for this thing. They could just ensure that their stuff fits on these supports, and we'd be pretty much good to go. No fussing about with cutting an engine down to fit and all that, right? Just, 
you've got where it goes, just make it go there. And so, there we go. Exhaust are in place. We are almost ready to close the fuselage. I basically have a few more things to do. Chief among them. We need to install the nose gear bay, but first we need to do a little bit of work in there to get some definition out of it. I'd rather do that now than trying to do it later on. We also have to deal with the heat shield, which is going to go back here, and which installs into the upper fuselage first, these posts, but we need to do some work to make sure that I can still install the stabilators after the fact. And then once that's done, and once we can glue it all together, we can have a nice, happy, joined-up Meng F4G. Okay, so let's examine the Meng heat shield and how the heat shield and the stabilators work. So basically, you've got stabilators. They've got each one has these little photo etch bits, which I've got to say is really fucking cool. They come on this sheet with this uh, clear film stuck on top of it. You can see right here. And inside of that, they were just sitting here inside the fret. No attachment points whatsoever. Just just completely free and open. You know, once you peel this off, they come away with the film. You pull them off, you're good to go. Okay, so those just kind of slot in here. The idea is that, you know, the stabilators can angle to whichever direction you want. Cool, cool. Then they basically join up like so. And this piece, this J9 piece, essentially sits right on top. This is uh, dicey as all shit. All right, I'm gonna pull these out and play with them visually. Okay, basically like that. Now I've been going back and forth with uh, Sam Dwyer, who's been building one of these, kind of ranging ahead of me a bit on it, and he was saying that his trick with these was basically to shave off a whole bunch of this J9 thing so these parts still kind of meet up, right? But that you can insert them after the fact. And then, once that's done, he's able to basically go in here and install this piece up into the fuselage. like so, and everything is just nice and fitting. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> that seems like a lot to hope for. Um, but what the fuck, let's go for it, right? So he said he cut these down by a lot, and considering that when they're in place, they stick through more than all the way, just like that. Um, yeah, that's that's a tricky thing to deal with. I'm going to try cutting it like that. This is where I just hope I didn't fuck myself. Okay, so it looks like should be able to do this. Get this in under here. And get it up. Okay, so that should work. In theory, that totally works. So now, we're going to 
test that theory. This is a bit dicier than I would like. But I mean, I guess that'll do, right? <laughs> it, it does what it should do, so cool. Okay, with that, I'm comfortable Bring this little piggy onto glue. And now that the heat shield is installed, it does need a little bit of cleanup, but you know, nothing too bad. It's time to go ahead and install the fuselage. Now, do not forget to install the nose gear bay. I had a change of heart and decided I'm gonna go ahead and weather it up in the future. Mainly because there are other pieces that still have to go in, but... Basically bring all this stuff together, as you do. I'm going to start with the gluing back here with the heat shield. I like that they put this back where the, uh, the engine exhaust is going to be, so you just won't even see it. Clever on their part. Not a fan of this mismatched panel line. So one thing, maybe the first thing I'm not liking too much about the uh, fit of this thing, and I've noticed it several times on the test fits and figured it would just kind of go away, but it's not, is there's a little bit of a gap action happening here. All right, well, we'll focus on basically everywhere else, getting everywhere else situated and happy, and coming back to that, so. Okay. So now we get to figure out what the fuck is up with the... This is one where I am gonna basically go about this two different ways. First of all, I'm going to hope that, you know what, let's do a little quick investigation here because this may be a, we have to jump straight to, shit. Just based on the way that the, Intakes go in, which is very well, by the way. Um, I think it's just, it may be best just to glue these fuckers like this and then come in with some putty down the road and just put something there. All right. So here we go. So one neat touch about the main kit is it actually comes with a metal pedo tube. And it even comes with like a separate little part that helps you get it installed so that it's F31. It's tiny, tiny, tiny. Basically what you do is you yeet it onto the front just like that. Let me go ahead and anchor that little thing down. All right, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of sanding once that's down in there, all nice and happy. But basically, once that's in there and kind of cleaned up, all you do is drill a 0.5 millimeter hole in it, and then you can put the pedo tube in, and that's great. Okay, so I feel like we're hitting a somewhat natural stopping point with the Ming F4G. In this episode, we got the intakes taken care of, we got the engines taken care of, we got the main fuselage and wings glued together, gear bays, etc., etc. And next up there's basically a lot of little shit that gets to go on. So we need to sort out the tail. 
not that big a deal, but you know, there's a few bits that need to go around it, etc. We need to go ahead and get the intakes installed. There's a little tiny piece that goes on in the inside here that needs to get sorted out, and I just have not had the gumption to do that yet, but they fit quite nicely. So that's up next. The radome and the radar warning receiver are coming up. Control surfaces front and back, so slats, flapperons, etc. And from there, we should be getting pretty close to main paint. Um, I know that I haven't touched the armament yet, so that needs to be dealt with. Basically, there's a lot in progress, but I think this video is probably already running pretty long, so this seems like a natural stopping point to put the Ming down and go edit some videos. So, thanks for watching to this point. Be sure to keep an eye out for future Ming F4G videos, as well as the Zuki Mira build, which is also a pace, as well as the Weasel Off series, which is basically comparing those two side by side. So, yeah, it's quite a bit. Uh, if you want early videos and behind the scenes and all that kind of fun shit, patreon.com slash dukesmodels, a great place to check that out. And until next time, catch y'all later.